The embryonic period is otherwise known as the period of organogenesis, and this occurs from the third week to eight weeks of development. Embryonic period is the time when the stem cell populations start to establish the main organs of the embryo. And for this reason, it's considered a critical period for normal development. Imagine if anything goes wrong during this period, then you could end up with abnormalities or congenital deformities. For this lecture, we are going to talk about the different periods of prenatal development. And then we'll describe what the embryonic period is characterized. And then one of the key events during embryonic period is neurulation. We will also talk about the derivatives of the three germ layers. And as we go along our discussion, we will be incorporating some of the clinical correlates. The periods of prenatal development would include the germinal period, which would be weeks 1 to 2. By the end of germinal period, you already have a bilaminar germ disc, and this would have already been implanted on the uterine lining. Embryonic period would be from 3rd week to 8 weeks of development. It is during this time that the embryo would be completely embedded in the endometrium, and a lot of other things would be happening during embryonic period, and this is the focus of our lecture today. This is followed by fetal period, which would be from weeks 9 up to birth. During this time, the embryo grow in size and complexity, such that ventrally, it forms two lateral body wall folds that eventually meet at the midline and fuse to close the ventral body wall. Because of this, the endodermal structures are enclosed inside, followed by the mesodermal derivatives in the middle and the outermost layer, the ectoderm, remains at the outside. The closure is actually aided by the head and tail folds that would cause the embryo to curve into a fetal position. All of this would create a 3D body plan for the embryo, whereby you have a tube within a tube body structure. Neurulation is also another important event, as well as the formation of the main organs during organogenesis. So what is neurulation? It's actually a process whereby the neural plate forms the neural tube. And once the neural tube is complete, then the central nervous system would be represented by a closed tubular structure where the narrow caudal portion develops into the spinal cord and the much broader cephalic portion will develop into the brain vesicles, eventually forming the brain. The neural tissue is derived from the ectoderm. It is the first tissue that is induced to develop. And this is possible as soon as cells from the notochord and the precordial mesoderm secretes growth factors that induces or causes the overlying ectoderm to thicken and form the neural plate. Cells of the neural plate make up the neural ectoderm. Fibroblast growth factor is one of the signaling molecules that induce the formation of the neural tube by inhibiting the expression of bone morphogenetic protein 4 or BMP4. And it also upregulates the expression of cordine and nugin, which inhibits BMP activity. But why must BMP4 be inhibited before neural induction can happen. It is because if BMP4 is expressed in a gastrulating embryo, the ectoderm is induced to form epidermis and the mesoderm will form intermediate in the lateral plate mesoderm. And so, in the absence of BMP4, 
the ectoderm can become a neural tissue. At the cranial region, secretion of three other molecules like nugin, cordine, and folistatin present in the organizer in the notochord and in the precordial mesoderm are responsible for inactivating BMP and they also neural, neuralize the ectoderm to form the forebrain and midbrain types of tissue. They also cause the mesoderm to become notochord and paraxial mesoderm. In the caudal region, induction of caudal neuroplate structures like the hindbrain and the spinal cord depends on two secreted proteins which are WINT3A and FGF. This 20-day-old embryo already has three pairs of somites and you will notice that by the end of third week, the lateral edges of the neural plate become elevated, forming what you call as the neural fold. And the depressed mid-region forms what you call as the neural groove. In this 22-day-old embryo, notice that gradually the neural folds approach each other in the midline here, where they fuse. And fusion begins in the cervical region somewhere around the fifth somite. And it will proceed cranially, going to that direction, and also caudally going to this part here and as a result you now form a neural tube and because the tube is not completely formed notice that the ends of the embryo actually have a communication with the amniotic cavity by way of the opening here which is actually your anterior or cranial neuropore and at the caudal end you have the caudal or posterior neuropore. This is a 23-day-old embryo and again it's showing the opening at both ends of the embryo whereby you still have the anterior neuropore here and also the posterior neuropore here at day 23. Now closure of the cranial neuropore occurs at approximately day 25. That would be somewhere around 18 to 20 somite stage. Meanwhile, notice that the posterior neuropore is still open at day 25. This is because the posterior or caudal neuropore closes at approximately day 28, which corresponds to 25 somite stage. And when that happens, we can say that neurulation is already complete. And you now have a central nervous system that is represented by a closed tubular structure. The narrow caudal portion of the tube becomes the spinal cord and the much broader cephalic portion will form the future brain. What would happen if the neural tube fails to close? If this happens at the caudal region, like in this figure here, then that condition is called spina bifida. The most common site of spina bifida will be in the lumbosacral region like in this picture here, suggesting that the closure process in that area may be more susceptible to genetic or in even environmental factors. 70% of defects or neural tube defects can actually be prevented if women would take around 400 micrograms of folic acid daily 
for like say three months before conception and they should continue taking folic acid during or throughout the pregnancy there are now medical procedures or surgical procedures that are possible for the treatment of neural tube defects like spina bifida in utero so please watch the video link that i will provide but if the neural tube fails to close in the cranial region then most of the brain will fail to form and the defect is called anencephaly. As the neural folds elevate and diffuse, here, cells at the lateral border or at the crest of the neuroectoderm here will begin to dissociate and leave the rest of the neuroectoderm. And it will go here in the mesodermal region. Migration of these cells, which are called the neural crest cells, can follow two pathways. One would be a dorsal pathway through the dermis, where they enter the ectoderm through the holes in the basal lamina, and they will eventually form the melanocytes in the skin and also the hair follicles and the second pathway would be a ventral pathway where through the anterior half of the somite they would become sensory ganglia um, sympathetic and enteric neurons some might even become the schwann cells and cells of the adrenal medulla so the neural crest cells also form and migrate from the cranial neural folds, leaving the neural tube before it closes. Now, those cells are very important because eventually they will contribute to the craniofacial skeleton. And there are many other structures that the neural crest cells can develop into. And that's the reason why they are sometimes referred to as the fourth germ layer. The induction of neural crest cells would have something to do with the concentration of bone morphogenetic protein or BMPs as well as other signaling molecules. In the case of BMPs, if the ectoderm is exposed to high levels of BMPs, then it will develop into an epidermis. But if the ectoderm is exposed to low levels of BMPs, it develops into a neuroectoderm and becomes a neural tissue. Now, there are some cells at the borders that would be exposed to intermediate concentrations of BMPs. And these are the cells that will later on become the neural crest cells. Of course, all of this would have Something to do as well with the presence of signaling factors such as FGF and WNT proteins and even PAX3 which specify the neural plate border and also induce neural crest cells formation. But other than that, there is a second wave of transcription factors. For example, snail and fox D3, which specify cells as neural crest cells, and slug, which promotes the crest cell migration from the neuroectoderm. In other words, the fate of the entire ectodermal germ layer actually depends on BMP concentrations as well as the presence of other signaling molecules. And abnormal concentration of any of these would be associated with neural crest defects, for example, in the craniofacial region, as demonstrated in some laboratory animals. This shows the migratory path of neural crest cells whereby as the neural crest cells migrate before the neural tube closes, 
It forms structures that are found in the face and in the neck as shown in blue color here. Example would be pharyngeal arches and some of the epibranchial plaque codes. The neural crest cells are sometimes called the fourth germ layer and it's because there are a lot of cells and structures that are derived from the neural crest. So just go over this table and take a look at the variety of structures and cells that are derived from the neural crest. Structures that are derived from the epidermis are usually those that maintain contact with the outside world. Example would be the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, the sensory epithelium of the ear, nose, and eye, the epidermis, including the hair and nails, and other than that, include as well the subcutaneous glands, the mammary glands, the pituitary gland, and the enamel of the teeth. Components of the mesoderm include the paraxial mesoderm here, which lies close to your neural tube, and here is the notochord. And right next to the paraxial mesoderm is a very, very thin mesodermal component, which is the intermediate mesoderm here. After the intermediate mesoderm that is followed by the lateral plate mesoderm that splits into two layers in this diagram here, and that's the other layer. So you have the visceral plate mesoderm and the parietal plate mesoderm here. This here is a 19-day-old embryo showing the mesoderm here. Remember that the mesoderm is actually formed from cells in the epiblast that migrated and settled in this region here. Now, this is day 19. And day 19 shows you that the mesoderm has already developed much, forming now the paraxial mesoderm, the intermediate mesoderm, which is this very small mesodermal tissue there, and also the lateral mesoderm. Now at day 20 here in figure C and day 21 in figure D, you will see that the mesoderm has already split, particularly the lateral mesoderm is split into the parietal plate mesoderm and also the visceral mesodermal layer. And of course, the yellow ones there are the endodermal structures and the blue ones here are the ectodermal structures. So at the start of third week of development, the paraxial mesoderm will start to form segments called somitomeres, which begin to appear at the cephalic part of the embryo and they continue to form in a cephalic caudal direction. Now each of the somitomeres are made up of mesodermal cells that become arranged in a concentric uh, manner and eventually they become compact and form somites. So the first pair of somites arises at the occipital region of the embryo and that would be sometime day 20 of development. And from day 20, new somites will begin to form at the craniocaudal sequence at a rate of usually three pairs of somites a day until the end of the fifth week. And by fifth week, there would be somewhere around 42 or even 44 pairs of somites by that time. And so there would already be around 4 occipital, 8 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral, and somewhere around 8 to 10 
coccygeal pairs of somites. Does that sound familiar? Well, I hope it does because it somehow corresponds also to the numbers of the vertebral bones that you have. Another important thing to note is that each of the somite actually forms its own sclerotome, which will become the future tendon, cartilage, and bone, and the myotome, which will provide the segmental muscle component, and it would have its own segmental nerves. And each somite also has its own dermatome, which forms the dermis of the back, having also its own segmental nerve. So when somites first form from the pre-somitic mesoderm, they actually exist as a ball of mesoderm resembling fibroblast-like cells. And these cells will undergo a process called epithelization and will arrange themselves into a donut structure around a small lumen. And by the beginning of fourth week, cells in the ventral and medial walls of the somite will lose their epithelial characteristics and they become mesenchymal again. And as they become mesenchymal, they actually shift their position so that they now surround the neural tube and also the notochord. And collectively, these cells form the sclerotome that will differentiate into the vertebra and the ribs. Cells at the dorsal and medial dorsomedial and ventrolateral edges of the upper regions of the somite will form precursors of the muscles, while cells between these two will form the dermatome. Cells from both muscle precursor group become mesenchymal again and then they start to migrate beneath the dermatome. And so you can see them here now. Okay. And it now forms what you call as a dermomyotome. Apart from that, cells from the ventrolateral edge would migrate into the parietal layer of the lateral plate mesoderm and these will later on become the musculature of the body wall. For example, the external and internal oblique muscles and the transversus abdominis muscles originate from that and most also muscles found in the limbs. Meanwhile, Cells in the dermomyotome, so cells here in your dermomyotome here, here, okay, will ultimately form the dermis of the skin of the back as well as muscles for the back and the body wall. Example, the intercostal muscle and some muscles of the limbs. Now take note, each myotome and dermatome will retain its innervation from the segment where it originated, no matter where the cells will migrate. And thus, I cannot overemphasize. Each of the somite will form its own sclerotome, its own myotome, and its very own dermis. They also have their own segmental nerve component. 
So, how is the somite differentiation regulated? Expression patterns of genes that regulate somite differentiation would include the sonic hedgehog or the SHH, the nugin, and these are actually secreted by cells found in the notochord here, here, as well as cells from the floor plate of the neural tube. And it will cause the ventral part of the somite to become sclerotome. So it causes it to become migratory, developing into a sclerotome. And these cells will now express Pax1, which in turn will control chondrogenesis and vertebrae formation. WNT proteins, in the meantime, from the dorsal neural tube, this one here, Okay. We'll activate PAX3. And after activating PAX3, it will cause now the formation of the dermomyotome. Whereby, what the WNT protein does is it will also direct the dorsomedial portion of the somite to differentiate into muscle precursor and therefore express muscle-specific genes like the MYF5 here. Now, the mid-dorsal portion of the somite will become later on the dermis under the influence of the NT3 which is expressed from the dorsal aspect of the neural tube. Additional muscle precursor cells are also formed at the dorsolateral portion of the somite, and this time it's under the combined influence of WNT proteins as well as inhibitory BMP4 protein, and together they will cause the activation of this gene here, MYOD. The intermediate mesoderm in the meantime will differentiate into urogenital structures except for the bladder. Now for the lateral plate mesoderm, it splits into two layers. You have the parietal, otherwise known as the somatic layer, which lines the intraembryonic cavity. And there is also the visceral or the splanchnic layer, which will surround the organs. The mesoderm from the parietal layer together with the overlying ectoderm will form the lateral body walls, which we described earlier. And these folds together with the head and the tail fold will be responsible for closing the ventral body wall. The parietal layer of the lateral plate mesoderm will form the dermis of the skin in the body wall and the limbs, the bones and connective tissues of the limbs and even the sternum. The sclerotome and the muscle precursor cells that migrate into the parietal layer of the lateral plate mesoderm in the meantime will form the costal cartilages, the limb muscles, and most of the body wall muscles. Meanwhile, the visceral plate mesoderm will, together with the embryonic endoderm, it will form the walls of the gut tube and the mesoderm cells of the parietal layer surrounding the intraembryonic cavity will form thin membranes like the mesothelial membranes or the serous membranes that would line the peritoneum, the pleural cavity, and the pericardial cavity. The mesoderm cells of the visceral layer will also form a thin serous membrane that surrounds the organs. Other structures that are derived from the mesoderm would be the blood and the blood vessels.
So how are blood vessels formed? Blood vessels can form in two ways. Vasculogenesis, whereby the vessels arise from blood islands. And angiogenesis, whereby blood vessels arise from pre-existing vasculature. So the blood islands appear in the mesoderm surrounding the wall of the yolk sac sometime at third week of development and slightly later in the lateral plate mesoderm and other regions. So these blood islands will arise from the mesodermal cells that are induced to form hemangioblast and the hemangioblasts are actually the precursor of the blood vessels and even the blood cells. So, during vasculogenesis, fibroblast growth factor 2 will bind to its receptor found on the mesodermal cells and it will cause the mesodermal cells to become hemangioblast. And then under the influence of vascular endothelial growth factor or VEGF, the VEGF binds to the receptor and it causes the hemangioblast cells to become endothelial and it will coalesce to form the blood vessels. Angiogenesis is regulated by VEGF which stimulates the proliferation of endothelial cells at points where new vessels form from pre-existing ones. However, the final modeling and stabilization of the blood vessels are accomplished by PDGF and TGF-beta. In summary, mesodermal derivatives would include the dermis, the vascular system, the urogenital system, and then the spleen and cortex of the suprarenal glands or the adrenal glands. Capillary hemangioma is an abnormally dense collection of capillary blood vessels that form the most common tumor of infancy, occurring in approximately 10% of all births. They may occur anywhere but are often associated with craniofacial structures, and facial lesions may be focal or diffuse with diffuse lesions causing more secondary complications, example, ulceration, scarring, and even airway obstruction if it happens in the mandible area. And it is believed that the insulin-like growth factor 2 might be responsible for the abnormal blood vessel growth. And it's not clear whether VEGF would have something to do with this capillary hemangioma abnormality. The endodermal germ layer provides the epithelial lining of the gastrointestinal tract, respiratory tract, and the urinary bladder. It also forms the parenchyma of the thyroid, the parathyroid and pancreas, and finally, the epithelial lining of the tympanic cavity, the auditory tube, are actually endodermal in derivative. By now, you should be able to describe the process of neurulation. Where is neural tube closure initiated and how does it proceed? And what week in gestation is this process completed? You should be able to answer what happens if the neural tube fails to close cranially or caudally. And what is a neural tube defect and how can it be prevented? You should also be able to describe the embryological origin of the neural crest cells. Are they ectodermal, mesodermal, or endodermal in origin? And what are the structures that they will develop into? You should also be able to identify the different derivatives of your ectoderm, mesoderm, and the endoderm.
So this ends our lecture. And always remember, life is beautiful.